There we go. Okay. Hello, stargazers. Welcome aboard the Santa Barbara Astronomical Unit Astro Hour, probably is denoted as SBAU Astro Hour on YouTube. The rest of us are on Zoom. There's four of us I'll introduce you to. We might have a fifth join us. You're probably on a line with us in the weekly Vice podcast of the South Coast. Long time astrophysics and telescope club is underway. Santa Barbara's Astronomical Unit. We've been around forever. It changed our name once. We'll talk about it. We're still grounded, though, by the pandemic, like so many other organizations, just one variable after another variant. We're doing all our business and meetings online, and I'm Vice President Ron Heron of the club. Well, let's meet the rest of the board on the 74th edition, by God, for July 25th, which is Monday today through the 31st. Our beloved four-term president, Running the show from home, Jerry Wilson. How are you, Jerry? Good morning. Good morning. Married to his lovely wife, Pat Borgie. Also married to a Pat. Um, Mrs. McPartland is our merchandise manager. And here's our outreach coordinator, Chuck McPartland. Good morning. Best there is. Uh, on the bottom left of my screen is a longtime member, a supporter, Santa Barbara Theater Organ Society President, Bruce Murdoch. Hello. And we may be joined by Tom Whittemore who is a former uh, Gus Westmont College science instructor and editor of our newsletter, which I got this morning. I'm not sure if the rest of me, everybody's supposed to get it from Colin Taylor, our beloved uh, longtime treasurer. What are we talking about today on this 74th issue? Crescent moons near Venus. Mercury is emerging from uh, the sun somehow. I had to do that. Oh, behind the sun. I got it. Check out a couple of asteroids. And NASA has got its next space telescope ready for launch in a couple of years, named after a woman and rogue black holes in our solar system. Well, not in our solar system, thank God, but in our galaxy. And we're two weeks away from our August 5th general meeting, everybody. It'll be online, Zoom. You can watch on YouTube, UCLA grad student Claire Williams talking about evolving galaxies. So, had a couple of uh, interesting cartoons sent to us, science sillies, I call them, from our president who finds these somehow and tickles the fancy of the gang here on screen, but it's time to throw it to you. Here it is, Night Sky with Calvin and Hobbes. I hope this is, they're sitting outdoors. Yep, that's the one. Uh, in the dark, Calvin's telling Hobbes uh, while under the stars. You know, if people sat outside and looked at the stars each night, I'll bet they'd live a lot differently, a bit differently. It's not as funny, but it's very cathartic, I think, unless I missed something in that translation. No, no. That's a good one. That should be a feel good cartoon. It is. You should post that on the wall somewhere. Oh, I've got <laughs> the cat opines. Our researchers pictured. Yeah, he's doing an experiment, I guess, involving the feline inside the box. No, Ron, um, this is this is Heisenberg. Right. Is that, is that Heisenberg? Oh, Schrodinger. Schrodinger. Yes. Schrodinger. Well, you don't know what, what the results are. I'm the sorry, experiment Schrodinger. Until you observe it. I don't know if the cat is dead or alive until I watch inside the box and suddenly yeah. it speaks up. Shut up. <laughs> All right, you're gonna have to tell us now. Here are a couple of uh, <laughs> aliens. Which one is this? Ah, the skunk one. Yeah. A couple extraterrestrials have abducted a skunk from down on Earth. Cartoon is labeled Earth's final alien abduction. You wonder why. Martian on the right says, now I'll just take this probe. Maybe they're lucky enough to have evolved without a sense of smell, gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> and they don't have any noses. Oh, they don't, do they? Every so often, I run into one of those on my early morning walk before dark. <laughs> All right, here we go. Well, no, the moon landing was staged. Get this. It was filmed by Kubrick, of course, Stanley Kubrick for 2001. However, it cost an insane amount of money. Kubrick was a perfectionist and demanded they film on location. There you go. We still love that as the best all around. All right, the lady gets transported back into the past. Is this the poor woman suddenly finding herself in an ancient world with? Nice, nasty dinosaurs looking her over. Carnivores. What? Carnivores. Yeah, the, the, the time machine looks strangely like a washing machine, and she's got the washing. She's the laundry lady. Yep. She tried the, okay, and she got sent back. 
<laughs> We're getting them all this week. Oh, here's a crater from a hard meteorite impact in Arizona. Of course, they go the other way down under. Australia's is a here's rock. <laughs> no, the implication is this pushed all the way through the earth and bulged on the other side. Oh, I hadn't thought of that. Okay. Yeah. It, that is Ayers Rock. Is that the name of it? Yeah. It's called Uluru now. Uluru. Yeah, change the name. Oh, for crying out loud. PC down under. Okay. Dr. Saturn talks to the earth says, I'm afraid you've got a bad case of humans. There's so many things that are going to wipe us out. There's Calvin and Hobbes again. Calvin okay. Is, Calvin That's is, it. Okay. Well, you scared me with your black hole story, but uh, there's a lot going on. You know what we haven't had recently is uh, your fluctuating stars, your Cepheids, your variables, but maybe that would happen when Tom- Next month, we'll have a variable of the month again from the American Association of Variable Star Observers. So much going on at our solar system, you know, with uh, not one, but two asteroids. And I like to just go out beyond our planet to start, if you don't mind, early morning Tuesday, and uh, then Mercury, your choice, whatever you call up, I'll, I'll uh, augment what's on the screen with whatever. You've got some great pictures, Jerry. Yeah, but, early uh, morning sky on Tuesday. Crescent moon is less than four degrees northwest of magnitude minus 3.9 Venus, hour before okay. sunrise. They will straddle the westernmost star in Gemini which is magnitude three epsilon germanorum, also called Metsuda. Hope I said that right, Mebsuda. It's between them. To the east are the heads of the Gemini twins, Castor and Pollux, both rising. Blue-white Castor is the higher of the two. And a, there, it's a binary system, right? Southeast would be the- a multiple, yeah. And then Southeast of that is a bright orange Betelgeuse, which is Orion's uh, shoulder upright, Orion's three-star belt possibly go straight up overnight. Let's see if I'm accurate on all this. There's the sky. Yeah. Okay, guide us through it, folks. Okay, well, there's the crescent moon you talked about. This is the morning of the 26th, which is tomorrow. Um, so just, uh, it's for the 26th. This is at 5 a.m. tomorrow. We're looking east, northeast. Venus is very low, just coming up. And there's the crescent moon, which is heading toward a new moon, I think in two days from this time. So that'll be later this week. Oh. You know, it's uh, a, a funny thing, when I sleep at night in my back bedroom, there's just a little hole in the curtain that every so often the moon is right there, beaming right uh -huh. through that little... What are the odds? Last night I saw the crescent. Then it moved over the day. Yeah. As well, as you well know. The, uh, you can see over on the lower right, you can see Orion. It's, it's just past conjunction with the sun. Um, and it's now starting its long cruise to be an evening object or a midnight object in winter. So it's a primarily a winter constellation. But it's just moving into the sky now from the sun. About three or four months ago, it was in the evening sky. So is it going to increase? You know, is this the beginning of the winter season for it? Well, this you can see the, you know, the winter seasons, the constellations of the seasons really is what's convenient to view in the evening. And so Orion in the winter is a convenient evening object. But you can see these things if you're willing to stay up all night. You can see almost all the constellations in a given night if it's clear. The, the few that the sun will block are just a, a minority of constellations. Is, Does that have anything to add about this? Well, would it be possible, Mr. President, to segue uh, into the Ursa Major? Because I got a question about these things, these constellations and star formations, what asterisms do they turn or turn or they don't turn a, totally around during the year, do they? Sure. It says Ursa Major, which is the, uh, the, the bear upright. It, it makes a complete circle every day, Ron. <laughs> I'm talking about looking at it above the horizon at certain times. Well, these, are, these are what are called circumpolar uh, for us because this, this is the pole star over here, Polaris. Are You, you see this um, finder chart? Yeah. The, uh, uh, and that one's up every night, all night, because it doesn't move. 
for us here in the Northern Hemisphere. There's the Little Dipper, and here's the Big Dipper up here with its handle going up. So this is what it means that it's right side up. Um, all these extra lines, I wouldn't put those in here, but the planetarium thing does to tie in all the other stars that are in it. And um, this thing will rotate around. Uh, it's going down in the, in the evening, but every evening it gets uh, farther. Which way does it go? It gets farther up. So no, it's, it sets, no, it's, it sets earlier. Excuse yeah. me. Yeah. And uh, sorry, I'm on some pain medications this morning. <laughs> I may need you to bail, jump in. You're um, doing fine. Two of these are, um, you can see over here, M81, M82. A very nice pair of galaxies. Um, this is a region rich in galaxies, M106, M100. Um, up here, farther out of the field of view is M51, the double galaxy. It's called the Whirlpool, but I think of it as a double galaxy. And uh, then there's, um, what is it, uh, Alcor up here, nice star, double star. But we can look at M81, M82 closer up. They're very nice objects. You can get them in a small, they're bright enough that you can see them in a small amateur telescope. And you can get both of them in the same field of view if you're not using uh, too, too high a power. And this is what it looks like, probably not in your telescope, but you can de definitely see the core of these two. This is Bode's galaxy. And I forget what this one's called for popular things. The cigar. The cigar, yeah. that's it. But it's got a very active core and you can see all this uh, ejectra from the core of it. It's got a very active core. And this one's a very nice uh, classic spiral. You can see, you can see um, drifts of stars out here. It looks like faint haze. I don't know if it shows up well on your screen, but there's um, extensions of the star fields out like this. And even over here and here from this galaxy, these have interacted and they, they've pulled things out uh, into the uh, medium between them. Uh, this is a very good photograph, very well processed. Only one of those is M81? Yeah, M80, one's M81 over here and the other's M82. Or is it the other way around? No, and I can never uh, remember them either. I think 81 yeah. is the big um, boats and yeah. 82 is the cigar. Yeah. Well, unless I misread your notes, Mr. President, it said toward the end of this passage, uh, these two um, M figures passed each other recently. How is that yes. possible? Oh, they just, everything's moving. And these things are close together. They have gravitationally interacted and they've passed by. The gravitational field that they, uh, the vector sum of their two gravitational fields has pulled stars probably either out of this one or out of that one. And that's what you see in these faint, faint dusty areas. These are large volumes of star clouds up, up here too. This one's more closely associated with this galaxy. And it's young blue stars here, so there's a lot of formation going on. But um, that's a result of their close passage of each other. They did not directly collide. They would be much more heavily distorted than they are if they had uh, come too close to each other. Oh. But it but used the word recently, so I'm, I'm wondering if recently is cosmological talk for like the last billion years or something. Yep, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. That's what it means. Yeah. Just, oh, okay. And so. the um, you, you see that you know, like Jerry said, eighty two is is all um, active there. You can see the hydrogen blown up by multiple supernovae, and that's because M eighty one is the five hundred pound gorilla, and it's tidally disrupting M eighty two and causing the the clouds of gas and dust to um, have density variations and collapse to form massive stars, which then live fast and die young and blow up. Fast and die young like Mad Max. And M81 and M82 are together, or one right after another. Old man Messier, I guess, nailed them both in his telescope same night, probably. When it's up, uh, which it is now, this is a prime topic for um, outreach. Oh, yeah. show that. It's, it's not it's not up in a good position now. That's why I was wondering, you know, it seems like these astronomy magazine articles pick things just when they're setting or just when they're rising, when it's worse to look at them instead of the best times to observe them. 
because it's you know when you say the the dipper is upright meaning the the bowl is way down um you go diagonally across the bowl and and quite a ways to find these galaxies and they're now very low in the sky so it's it's such a weird thing that astronomy magazine does I I've, I've noticed that timing also yeah I figured that they're just they understand that their readership is very lazy and they're yeah. not going to stay up late well, when you live where we do, when you have all the, uh, the, the sea fog and whatnot, you can't see anything down low. You know, it's just well, are, are the down, down are the down low galaxies and constellations the ones that we lose part of the year, like Orion, or yeah, or we see the stuff overhead, like the Dipper, pretty much uh, year round, right? No, the no, the Dipper we lose behind our mountains for a while because of our horizon. The Big okay. Dipper. Even though we're in the northern hemisphere and about halfway up, we're looking north. Yeah, we lose it only for a short time because we're in the northern hemisphere. But So you're not saying that happens to all constellations. Are there some constellations up in the middle somewhere that we see year round always? No, they would have to be near the North Pole. Yeah. Oh, and that just, well. You can, see the, ones, those you can see the ones down, down closer like to the equator most of the year by staying up all night. Uh, you'd be able to see the little days, all, all you know, night. for a given star, maybe that it won't be visible because of the sun. Hi, Tom. Yeah. Hi. Hi, you guys. Uh, Tom, I hope you weren't waiting long. Your 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 request to come in was hidden behind a share. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I don't see you yet either, but uh, it's okay. You're not missing much, Ron. I know these beautiful galaxies outshine you, Tom. But a great great job editing our newsletter. Oh, there he is. Now we got oh. everybody on there. Did you guys enjoy the article on Shuba? Yeah. Oh, I haven't read that it was, yet. That was fun to write. Yeah. Oh, you didn't give yourself credit for that. I kept wondering. No, no, I never do. It just it's star stories, and you know. Did you did you do the one on on Terry's last month? I do them all. I, anything star stories is my creation. Yeah. Well, hey, give yourself uh, credit, man. You know. Yeah, it's just uh, I I figured you guys were getting tired of the captions. So much. No, so the captions well, are great. If we yeah. get tired of them, you'll hear from us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're back to the same sky or a different sky. No, this is the uh, early evening sky. Ah. I'm, I'm I'm segueing from Chuck's comments about uh, the stuff being too low in the sky to really see conveniently or effectively. This oh. is uh, Mercury just popped around, out from um, being in conjunction with the sun. And uh, it's, it's very low at um, 8.30 in the evening tomorrow night. Now, you need a horizon just like this, which I don't think any of us have here. <laughs> and uh, mine's, mine's probably up about here because of the San Inez Mountains. Uh -huh. but, uh, um, so okay. anyway, Mercury is technically in the evening sky now. It's past the sun, and it will get higher each night. But if you do have, uh, if you are on top of a mountain and you look really quick, you can still see the rays of the setting sun here from my planetarium software. So you can technically see Mercury. With the naked eye. With what? With your naked eye, not a, You'd not be able to. Yeah, yeah you, well, with your naked eye, just like this, or binoculars. Okay. Yeah, and you see the sickle of the lion. Yeah. The gentleman have told me this before. Forgive me for asking until I get it down. What is the cutoff point in magnitude that you can no longer see with your naked eye? Is it four, five, or depends on the sky conditions? Yeah. Lately, we've had just phenomenal skies here, and I've been, you know, again, I'm, I'm kind of a binocular guy these days. Just been having a blast with them. So the other well, night, uh, I was up on the on the mountain for an asteroid occultation, and it was Mag Six skies. So that's pretty wow. good. Good. <laughs> yeah. But little Mercury is minus 1.2 and Venus is minus 3.9. Does that mean Mercury is brighter than Venus? No. No, oh, no, no. The negative goes number the... is brighter. Yeah, it goes the other way, Ron. I thought the lower it was. To get higher higher right. numbers are dimmer. They're harder, yeah. to, harder to get to. Ron, minus three is less than minus one. Oh, I see. Because of the minus sign. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. I, math was never my major subject, but I loved it. I just, That's because they didn't think through the uh, brightness scale when they picked something that was zero brightness, zero magnitude. This, 
this is a legacy of, of ancient Greece. What's that? This, this is when Ptolemy, I think, his catalog, he said, oh, these are stars of the first magnitude. And then if they were yeah. dimmer, they were of the second magnitude. And if they were yeah. even dimmer, they were the third magnitude. And it was a real sort of squishy scale. It was yeah, real qualitative. You know, well. Right. It was in the mid 1800s that basically the Germans set it to a logarithmic scale. Yeah. And so that's probably driving you crazy, Ron. <laughs> so that's what the of, of anyway, anyway I, I was on a tour, a VIP tour of uh, uh, Mauna Kea one time, and we stopped at the um, visitor, not the, 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 at the dormitories at about 8,500 feet up the side. And we had a star party there into the night, hosted by Stephen James O'Meara. Mm -hmm. And the skies were, I have never seen skies like that. They were easily uh, magnitude seven skies. And the, the, the downside of that is that there are so many stars that I don't normally see that I could not recognize the individual constellations. And I was trying to find um, Hercules, and I had this <laughs> pointed out to me because there were so many stars. That was my experience the first time in the early 80s that I went up on West Camino Cielo with, with my telescope that I had just gotten. It was a it was a too many stars situation, but now yeah. that doesn't happen at all. Yeah, it, it happens in southern Utah, Chuck. Yeah, it doesn't <laughs> happen here though. Yeah, yeah. Well, it happens on my planetarium program because you can see <laughs> <Yeah>. the magnitude, <laughs> and I have to keep it uh, like the skies I'm used to. So yeah. we just see a few stars. Yeah, when I first came down here uh, with Maureen to visit her mom, we, we were still up in the Bay Area where you can't see a darn thing. Uh, I remember this would be about 1995, just roughly, lying down in the backyard here and seeing M13 naked eye. Huh. I don't think I can see that anymore. But, yeah. uh, I don't think we can see much anymore with all the light pollution we have. No. Some of those pictures coming in from, from uh, James Webb are just sprinkled with stars. I have no yeah. idea. It's sprinkled with galaxies, Galaxy. actually. Yeah. Is that what it is? Yeah, it's on deep field. And and Chuck and I, I was going to say Chuck and I and others went to a viewing at the Museum of Natural History when they started throwing out some of these first images, and they had several wonderful astronomers there talking about you know the first pictures off the web, and uh, one of them said uh, basically everything you see in the background is a galaxy and it uh, contaminates the view. <laughs> All these yeah. galaxies. <laughs> I, I think they're, they they launched out a number for the number of ga new galaxies they've found so far in the James Webb images, and it's 10 million. Wow. wow. 10 million galaxies. And again, Ron, that's a grain of sand held at arm's length, that, that field of view, just roughly. Well, then how can they say there's an end to the universe? It just goes on forever and ever. It's, it's infinity. Well, it, it will never it be. Able. how much time you give the light to get to us. Right? Yeah. So we don't know how big it is. No. Yeah, but you can only see for a radius of 13.5 or 8 billion years. So right. Jerry, right? Because the, the universe didn't become transparent for the first 300,000 years. Yeah. But Jerry wrote a fabulous yeah, but that's, article. Yeah, that point is mil, hundreds of million uh, there, um, yeah. Bruce. And, and Jerry uh, highlights this in a fabulous article he wrote in the August issue. I, I don't know if it's out to the, the populace yet, but uh, he talks about that kind of thing. He talks about how big the universe probably is, you know. Well, for our September general meeting, I've got uh, Rocio Kiemen, Kiemen, UCSB, Rocio, the lady. Rocio Kiemen, yeah. Yeah, she is the uh, co-hostess, uh, our host with Chrissy Webb, uh, Chrissy Cook of our club of a great YouTube video that's out. I'm not sure how you access it, but they're also going to do our, our September 3rd general meeting that night together. By then, we'll have all kinds of new stuff from the uh, old James Webb. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, just for the record books, 93% uh, lit. Mercury is sinking into cancer. It's a terrible thing to say. But... That's, that's, that's the slide we just looked at a moment ago. I understand yeah. that. Where are you going now? And I'll. Oh, um, 387 Aquitania asteroids. Ah, we're talking asteroids, big rocks. Yeah, uh, this is one of the lesser bright ones because it was found later on after yeah, the it's got a higher number. The, uh, the red bullseye is not the asteroid. That's around the star that's referenced in the uh, talking points. 
to, and it's within a one and 1.7 degrees. The asteroid itself is up in this region compared to that star. And the star is New Ophiuchi, third magnitude. Okay. But it's not it's not labeled in the uh, in the uh, finder chart here. But this is in you can see the Milky Way down here in the Great Rift. This is in the region of Sagittarius. There's Scorpio with uh, the claws, and this is an extremely rich area. Matter of fact, in this area, you don't even need. To, there's uh, all sorts of Messier objects in here, but you can just point anywhere in this area, and you're going to see massive amounts of star clouds and stars and probably some Messier objects just by accident. This is the this is the summer sky. And by the summer sky, this is we mean this is in the evening right now. So this is at uh, 8 p.m. on uh, tomorrow, 26. But it will be this way all week. M oh, M8 was, was, yeah, go ahead. M8 was visible naked eye at Kachuma. You know, wow. averted vision, but but there. <laughs> And so we put it on the Malin cam and it just filled the screen with uh, <laughs> nebulosity. Yeah, M8 is right down here in the star cloud. Did uh, old man Messier ever name an asteroid after him with an M? No. I don't know. You, you can't no, he, really he, see he them. He didn't find any asteroids. Yeah. Okay, well, this one is uh, 387 Aquitania. Do we know who discovered it? How many do they have? You could Thousands. probably look it up. Okay. It's got an elliptical orbit, and it's coming in just like pan stars. In fact, they're both in Ophiuchus. Yeah, it's about 10th magnitude right now. Okay. And um, does it mention here who found it? Got the monolith on my screen again. I'm oh, yeah, sorry. I'm feeling cosmic. <laughs> but better? That's yeah. Better. I, yeah. Cut, okay. off, I cut off that screaming input from Jupiter that just arrived at my house. Uh-huh. Okay. So uh, M8 Aquitania, is down here now. There's Aquitania was discovered in 1894 by a French astronomer in Bordeaux Observatory named F. Courty. Well, I'll be darned. In case that matters. <laughs> <laughs> we love to be thorough. But elliptical, I mean, how, how many of these, everything has pretty much an elliptical or, orbit. Even we do, don't we? Even the right. Earth. Yeah, well, it's... A circular, a circular orbit is a special case of an ellipse. So everything <laughs> that's bound to the sun has an elliptical orbit. The other type of orbit is an open orbit, which Oumuamua had. That is, it comes in as a hyperbola. It comes in, speeds by, and zooms out. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, if something is tidally locked around a, st a star or the sun, like I've heard uh, Mercury is tidally locked. It's facing always the same side is that possibly no it has a no, little no, bit no. no it's it's not oh it's not completely tidally locked it's in a different kind of resonance like one and a half yeah so my question would be to be tidally locked you'd have to have a pretty much circular orbit like the moon does around uh, the earth no the moon don't have a circular orbit elliptical. it's elliptical in order to be in order to be tidally locked it needs to have a non-spherical mass distribution inside of itself then it will end up being tightly locked. Yeah. And it so, needs to be in a fairly strong gravitational field. Yeah. Well, a weaker gravitational field, it'll take a lot longer. Yeah. I wonder if binary stars sometimes get tightly locked. Is that That's possible? a good question. I don't think so. They're sort of fluid structures. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Wait, uh, you want to go on to the next asteroid, uh, 3 Juno? Just First, let me just point out one thing. Um, down here, you can see M4, which is right yes. here on Antares. And, and Jerry, I saw in binoculars last night from the backyard. Okay. It's a pretty, pretty good night. So as, as Tom said, you can see this is an easy find because you can see Antares, it's unmistakable. And mm -hmm. within a, about a degree from it is M4. Mm -hmm. And so it's very easy and it's a massive globular star cluster, very pretty. Mm -hmm. It's got a neat linear feature in it that, that makes it look like a cat's eye pupil. So it's often called oh, yeah. a cat's eye globular. Now those features that occur in globular clusters are again um, brightness dependent. You yeah. can get a long exposure of, of a globular cluster and all of the visual features disappear because you see you're capturing many more stars. There's a 
veins, there's a three a three prong propeller in M13 that you can sort of see visually, but you can't see it in a good photograph. Or at least I haven't seen it. Technically, so if you want to go to the other. We can see those uh, those clusters in even other galaxies, can't we? Sometimes mm -hmm. I've seen G1 in my 18 inch in Andromeda. <laughs> G1 is a globular there. It's safe to say that you guys rather go out at night than in the early morning? Not for oh, me. No. Yeah. Uh, I, I do early morning, except we've gotten fog lately, Ron. Yeah. Uh, I've been kind of watching the moon dance through these planets, and I was hoping to see the moon pretty close to Venus this morning, but we were fogged out. And it's on final wax or is waning? Yeah, it's a real thin uh, crescent. <coughs> waning yeah. crescent. Yep. Yeah. Ooh, good time to watch. So I've, you I've got an asteroid tonight where I'm going to be kind of racing the, the marine layer. Because <laughs> <laughs> if I, I head up the mountain, I'm getting away from the shadow path. So okay. I won't be able to escape it. I just have to hope to that it's a little slow coming in. Yeah. Well, well, I should have mentioned that tomorrow morning, if, if we get a clear sky, uh, about five o'clock, Venus is coming up right now. And then there's going to be a real thin piece of moon just to the left of or to the north of, of Venus just before sunrise. I, I was hoping, I'm hoping to get that tomorrow, but we've gotten fogged out quite a bit lately here. Yeah. I prefer to walk in, under the fog in the morning. I hate squinting. My observing time is usually from... Um, dark until about uh, two or three when I get tired and go to bed. I'll yeah. stay up till the early morning, but I can't get up in the morning. My body <laughs> just won't do it. No, some of, bright, some of us are bright. baking bread. Some of us are baking bread at, you know, six. <laughs> <laughs> you wonder who. Why do I smell sourdough? So here's uh, three more, more asteroids. Juno up here, Vesta, and, oh God, it says uh, Althea. Right. Almost, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yep. Can so you read that okay? Or do you need it bigger? Got uh, seven stars, according to your notes, uh, from the circlet of Pisces, asterism, gamma, seven. Yeah, there's, there's the circlet. They keep okay. talking about the circlet in Pisces because it's an easy asterism to spot. It's just like the uh, easiest one in the whole sky is the great square of Pegasus. In yeah. my view. Yeah, the circlet is really tough. Yeah, they're pretty dim, Chuck. You're right. They're pretty dim. And they don't have uh, it all marked here. They're leaving out this star and this star. So it's more of a circle the way I remember it. Yeah. No, it's not, it's not made out of bright stars. That's certainly true. Mm -hmm. But it's as close to a circle as you're going to get? Well... At least in something that size, it's <laughs> yeah. the, the nicest one up there. Mm -hmm. hmm. That is an asterism. Is it part of a constellation? Yes. Pisces. Yeah, yeah, this is the constellation. These faint blue dotted lines, these are the borders of uh, the constellations. Which is... those, are, those are basically invisible, actually, on, on this scale. Right. When mm -hmm. I'm looking at it. You need you need super clear nights to be able to see yeah. these. <laughs> <laughs> I missed it. I missed it. What's the constellation again? Pisces. The Pisces, the fish. Poor right here in green. That's why it's called the circle of Pisces. Yeah. So that's one of the fish, Ron. Yeah, of course. That's the big this fish. Is, this yeah. is Jupiter here, which is this 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 was overhead or coming up in the east at mm -hmm. one a.m. Jupiter is up, well up by this time. So Jupiter yeah. is actually uh, technically, since it's up past, rises after midnight, it's now in the evening sky. Or yeah. before midnight, I mean. I'm seeing Saturn, Jerry, at about 9.30 here yeah. in the backyard. In the evening? Yeah, mm -hmm. we, we were showing Saturn off at Kachuma. Huh, okay. Mm -hmm. And Mars oh, was oh. visible the other night, too. It was low. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah Saturn, Saturn is over here. Yeah. Okay. And Juno used to be a planet. Yep. <laughs> right. Did it really? Well, Jupiter, <laughs> Jupiter as seen in infrared by the web was kind of strange and weird, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh, last week, yeah. yeah I think it's an apple. 
Alaska too, Chuck. Pardon me? I think it's the capital of Alaska now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know, you can't drive to Juneau, Alaska. Also, incidentally, gentlemen, real fast, I want to throw this at you, if you don't mind, while Jerry calls something else up. In the new issue of Reader's Digest for July, August, page 102, Brain Games. This is what it says. This is fact or fiction. You th I would imagine you know this. I took a guess. Uh, three moons of Uranus are named after characters in Midsummer Night's Dream. Yeah. True? Yeah. Do you, can you name them? They're, they're Shakespearean moons like crazy. Hermione? <laughs> is Hermione one of them? Sounds familiar. That is yes. the name of a moon. I'm, I'm not sure which planet it's on, but yeah. I, I was in two versions of Midsummer Night's Dream. I played one of the mechanicals, a lion. You didn't play lion. the donkey? What? You didn't play the donkey? No, no, I didn't do the ears <laughs> thing. Not me. I had two pages of Shakespearean dialogue. I have no idea what I was saying. What is this? Can you guys see this um, projection of M74? Yeah, that's beautiful. Okay, so this is a Hubble const, a Hubble picture um, from NASA, the European Space Agency, and the Hubble Heritage. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a very nice face on spiral, lots of veins and stuff in it. And we have the same picture taken by James Webb here. Yeah. It's also, Jerry, don't forget, it's also a target in the Messier Marathon, one of the first targets. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 77 and 74. You know, they're tough early. In if the you can get them in the glow. Yeah. <laughs> but this this web telescope image is fantastic. Yeah. yeah red. Uh, that looks like a fractal. Yeah. When I, find, when I find these web pictures, it's very few people that post them or very few <laughs> sources that, that lists the um, wave band. Then. So you have to dig to find it. This is with the NIR camera. And these these big voids in here are very intriguing. Wow. So <clears throat> what's happening here in the core, I don't know yet. Wow. That might That's be what a supernova bubble or something. Something could be. Looks suggestive like that. A mm -hmm. lot of activity there, a lot of clouds, a lot of dust. That's amazing. Your notes say best seen in November for the rest of us. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, that sounds about right. Mm -hmm. And it's a grand design, symmet totally symmetrical spiral arm galaxy. Huh? Face, on. Face on. Wow, that's from that's from uh, Hubble or uh, oh, this, Webb? this is James Webb. Oh, already. God. Yeah. This um, wasn't a bard either. This is from uh, Hubble. Oh, which one is this? The this is the one, same right? galaxy M seventy four. That's invisible light. That, yeah. And a little bit of near actual near IR. This is in deep IR, but JWST calls it NIR. <laughs> so is it is it fair to say it's not a barred galaxy like ours? That's no, correct. it's not a barred. Wow, that barred thing has me totally buffaloed. We might oh. want to talk about uh, black holes at some time roaming around, but these are fascinating pictures you got. Yeah. And uh... by the way, I sent out a paper that was written by a, <clears throat> a graduate student or a postdoc at uh, uh, California, see, uh, uh, Cal come on, uh, California Institute of Technology down in LA uh, or Pasadena that uh, was saying one of the reasons that the, uh, the galaxies don't follow you know, gravitational laws is there's a lot of electrostatic or electrodynamic uh, interaction going on too, forces from that that they haven't accounted for. Hmm. I've thought of that, but um, I haven't read any interesting papers on it. I sent a paper around. I guess I'll send it out again. I yeah, you did. On, yeah. Send it again to give, give me his name and I'll book him sometime. Okay. Now, this is the beginning of the black hole, nasty stuff here. We're looking at a dimming star or one that brightens somehow. What right. they're looking at here is, um, let's see, I may have a, something that shows the effect better before we get into that. 
Um, let's see. Is it, let me just say, scientists estimate 100 million of these suckers we can't see are uh, cruising around the galaxy. Yeah. Little rogue black holes. I, now, this, I, is back, this is back to Hubble data again. Can you see this okay? Yeah, that's great. It's okay. Nice. Really so, nice. Um, this is back to Hubble, and it's measuring just like um, analogous to our sun when in, what, 1917, they observed it during an eclipse and they could account for the bending of starlight around the sun's mass due to the sun's gravitation. Well, with the same thing that they're looking for with uh, very massive black holes or with very massive sources being a black hole. And this represents the bending of space time right. for that um, due to the black hole. And here is, here is the real position of a star um, and this is, so this is how we detect, not the star, but how we detect the black hole, because the black hole, you can't see it. So if there's a star behind the black hole, the light path goes through here. It isn't close enough that it can't get back out. So it comes back out and, it, and we see it in the Hubble telescope, which is represented here. But since we see what we see, uh, we assume is a straight line. So we see the star here. And so what, as the black hole moves in front of a star, we can see the star um, change its position and its brightness. And so we look for those things and then follow them up. And that's what we have here with um, a black hole here taken on August, October, September of 2012. This is 2011 and then up to 2017. And you can see the star here is- Jerry, you don't higher. have that share screen up. So we, we're- Oh, we're, I'm sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So here from 2011, October, 2011, September, 2012, August, 2017, you can see that the star is um, very bright, getting dimmer. So this is not an occultation but it's due to the bending of the uh, light from that star, but it's not due to this star. There's something passing in front of this star that you can't see. There it is in a wider field view. And so that is the, um, that is how they find a black hole. Let's see if I have a, just a second here. Oh, yes. Oops, I got it. Your, your notes say it's called gravitational microlensing. I wonder yes, if it's yes. diff different from regular gravitational lensing. Nope. Uh -huh. Same thing. It's on a smaller scale. I wonder why we can't, why don't we see that in, with naked eye, just looking at the stars at night? Because it's a, it's a very small effect. It is. And, and it's, it happens in, you know, one out of a couple of billion, hundred billion stars. So, and, <laughs> and, and Bruce is right. It's called micro lensing because it's a much smaller object. The other times you're talking about gravitational lensing, you're usually talking about a huge cluster of galaxies doing the, leg, the lensing. Well, is this, a, is this a binary we're looking at? Do they orbit no. each other? No, no, no. Oh, they don't. Okay. No, this is this is just a video clip made out of those stills I just showed you that shows uh, the brightening because of, of something dark is passing in front of that star here in the center. It, it, but you notice know, nothing uh, else in here is changing significantly. <laughs> 2011. Cloud another five years, it should get bright again. Uh, yeah, that's, that's not clear. It might be, but that's not clear to me. Okay, not, because we don't know how dim it's going to get. Yeah. Wait, Ron. Uh, wait, wait. It got bright because the black hole passed in front of it. Yeah. So it's not like the black hole is dimming it. Yeah. Oh. But it doesn't leave a black hole like, or I, there's the word I did. In other words, transiting planets would 
dim the light a little. This does just the opposite. Yes. It yeah, and it didn't directly light. transit in front of it, Ron. It's just the the, the distorted space time around it transited it. But it's not going to it's not going to come back. It's now gone forever. Or wherever right. It's going. Yes. That's, that's right. That's it's the trouble. <laughs> that's the trouble with these gravitational lensing events, like the Ogle search for transiting planets, is that you you just get one shot at it. Yeah, so talk, you can talk only, to Eddington about that. You can only see something like Einstein's cross in a telescope. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are very faint effects, and you can only see those things in very big telescopes. Yeah, really. Can't see them in binoculars, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> just amazes me that yeah. light waves aren't going all over the place because just a little tiny go by the Earth and it's going to be deflected a little, little but it will result in a wide span thousands of light years from here, wouldn't it? Yeah. Everything should affect light. Well, that's we had we had a guy speak at the club once talking about using uh, the Earth uh, as a uh, gravitational lens to look at things farther away by placing a satellite in just the right place. Right. Really? What would it see? That, that arc? That's going to tell us something? A little. Yeah. Well, it's it's magnifying. Yes, we can, and it can tell us a lot because uh, when when a galaxy makes an arc from another galaxy farther away, we have to estimate the, the, the shape of the lens and its aberrations from the galaxy's ma uh, mass distribution. But if we use the Earth, we know the Earth's mass distribution, so we can get a very accurate uh, deconvolution of what we're looking at. Now, are we looking at the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope? Yes. This is an artist's rendition of what that telescope will look like. And the announcement here is that NASA has awarded a launch services contract for spe to SpaceX to launch this in 2026, October 2026. Who uh, was, we know who this lady was? Sue yes. Conover. Okay. Nancy Grace Woman Roman. Uh, this 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 cracks me up about it. This is uh, the way that NASA defined or one of NASA category contracts. It's an indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity contract. <laughs> that is a sort of do your best, hope for yeah. the best, and here's the money. Captain so, Tesla. Yeah. I guess Elon bailed out of his Twitter deal, didn't he? He's going to pay him a million. He's trying to. He's trying to. He's going to court over again. <laughs> so 26, why is this going up? What's it going to look at? Just uh, what we're talking about, lensing? It's just going to look for, among other things, it's going to look for... Um, it's yeah. infrared, Ron. Yeah. Oh, it's infrared like the web. Probably yeah. different wave bands. It says NASA's upcoming Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope will discover several thousand microlensing events like oh, okay. one we just looked at. That's one of its topics that it's going up for. How so it is doing paint? lensing, Ron. You're yeah. right. So are expected to be black holes. And the deflections will be measured with very high accuracy. Wow. And I, I, I think this is one of those telescopes that sort of was a surprise to NASA because uh, the National Security Agency had three or four of these in a warehouse and they decided there were surplus and they just gave them to NASA. Mm -hmm. Well, the deal should cost... They were originally meant to be spy satellites, but mm -hmm. you know, they were repurposed. The Roman, the Roman Space Telescope is the top priority large space mission recommended by the 2010 Astronomy and Astrophysics Decadal Survey. Wow. So <clears throat> they're getting to it and working their way through the list. <clears throat> but these old, as, as Chuck points out, these uh, satellites that are stockpiled or parts are stockpiled, um, that's a um, risk management step in aerospace is that when you build something like the Hubble Space Telescope, you it's a it's assembled out a large number out of a large number of subcontracts or sub sub assemblies, and so you make many more sub assemblies than you need, and so at each stage you you leave behind a decreasing number of spare parts until you get down to the minimum three that you want. They usually keep one back on Earth in many cases to play with, especially the rovers, so they can try to see how it slips on things when it's chugging around. 
But these extra spare parts are very handy, and that's what they put the New Horizons spacecraft together using partly was um, leftover risk management parts from previous satellites. And they had such a short term and small amount of money to get the satellite ready for a, a, all of a sudden a launch window that they they took their own risk management, which was to make fewer mechanisms. And the more mechanisms there are, the more risk there is. So when you want to send something out to Pluto in the cold of space, you want it to have almost nothing on there that can jam or go wrong. So they didn't have any gimbals to point the camera. When you want to point the camera, you have to move the whole spacecraft. And so that was a very low risk. That risk reduced the risk significantly. And, and as an aside, um, that's an advantage that electric cars have over mechanical cars is that plethora of detailed and intricate mechanical parts that all rub against each other and wear out um, are not there in an electric car. Right, so, but if you don't do your derating properly, the electronic components, they fail too. They do. But they do fail. There's fewer of them. Uh, but yes, it's not. It's a less intricate thing. And that was a problem with Hubble. Uh, I mean, yeah, with Hubble, they had two mirrors that they made. One was yeah. perfect and one was flawed. And they accidentally, well, they, they picked the wrong they one to same. send it to space. Yeah. Uh, you know, when Burke and Elmer solved the problem by changing their name to Danbury Optical Systems. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, Perk and Elmer, um, Hughes Aircraft Company bought Perk and Elmer. Oh. And Hughes Aircraft Company changed the name to Danbury Optical System. Once okay. it came out that the, that the, um, that the um, system was flawed and they wanted to get away from that. And, it went, <laughs> and they sued, I think they paid like $3 billion or something. And they, they sued Perk and Elmer because of uh, loss of what... Um, status in the public eye because of the failure and they won about a billion dollars back so we Danbury optical system worked hand in hand with uh, santa barbara research center here and when you worked out there your, your hands were on some items that are still in space jerry not not my hands we have there's a whole structure of um bosses you know the the joke is there's a um, um six chiefs to every Indian, but um, there, um, which is not quite true, but there seems to be, but there are teams. And over my entire career at uh, Hughes Aircraft Company, um, I've been a junior member of teams. I've been a senior member of teams. I've been a technical lead of teams and I've been a manager of teams. So in that sense, you know, I have instruments that I was responsible for that are orbiting Mars and on Mars, but everything is absolutely a team effort. And you wear gloves. Uh, more than that, you wear yeah. bunny suits, especially people with beards. You you only have your eyes showing through things. And in some of these things, especially dealing with mercury cadmium telluride, which uh, has um, dopants in it, you know, uh, a blunt, a chunk of material has about ten to the twenty three atoms in it. But electronic parts, their properties are defined by uh, materials or impurities in it at the 10 to the 15 to 10 to the 16 level. So that's way below 10 to the 23rd. So you have to be in an absolutely clean environment to have control of the properties of the materials you're making. So um, in some of these labs, uh, people are not allowed to wear cosmetics. They're not allowed to, wear, to use certain soaps in their showers. They're not allowed to wear especially gold rings, wedding rings, any kind of jewelry, because all those things will contaminate, you know, the vapor that you don't even notice will contaminate these materials. Um, it took us a long time to figure out how sodium was getting into our some of our parts and ruining it. Um, but being in the ocean environment here, you know, we finally filtered out that and got it done. Mm. But, that means you can't eat beans either then, right? Uh, you can, but you're not going into the lab that day. <laughs> Just breathing one of, would contend. One of the things they, they test for, too, is, is we, you know, in the lab where they make the, the thorium, the, the mercury, cadmium, telluride crystals, um, you can just breathe the, the tellurium and you get tellurium poisoning, which is toxic. And your uh, tellurium is what gives onions its uh, unpleasant odor. And really? so if you're talking to someone and it seems like they just had onions for lunch, 
you have to turn them in because they have to take two weeks off to detoxify because they're they've they've accumulated somehow in the lab they've accumulated probably through their bare hands off a desktop or something they've accumulated tellurium jerry i understand if you breathe in inspi you smell like garlic oh <laughs> could be yeah well how do you spell tellurium that's not an element i've never yeah, heard it is it. L U R I U M to Lurie. Okay. And it's an element. Yeah. Yes. It is an element. You're yes. kidding. What number? Oh, it's heavy metal. Thank you. Really? And it's what gives onion its. It's <laughs> onion. Yeah. No. Niobium. Niobium gives uh, bananas its banana. Niobium. Jeez. Yeah. Lurium uh, is 81. Yeah. It's in the metals. I saw a, a YouTube video yesterday about a launch back in 2013. I'm wondering, I had never heard of it. I don't know why. Maybe it's still up there. Maybe you know about it. The Gaia telescope. Oh, yeah. yeah. It supposedly was put in L2, where yeah. the web is now. Are, is, are they both there? There's a couple of satellites there. Really? And they don't attract each other? Well... Sure, they've got mass, but it's a it's a hugely tiny amount. <laughs> well, you know, asteroids about the size of a small car would be about the same weight. They attract, don't they, sometimes? But the Gaia was launched nine years ago, and I hadn't heard about it. It's it's getting extremely precise measurements for, at least from my point of view, for star positions and asteroid positions. And so the predictions for asteroid occultations have gone oh, no, from having 100 kilometer uh, error bars to having like one kilometer error bars. It's just amazing. Yeah. Our tellurium's 52, not the other one's thallium. The print's very small on my okay. periodic table. <laughs> Fascinating stuff. I always learn. I just wish I could keep it with me. Mm -hmm. Nancy Grace Roman telescope, uh, October of 2026, on board a Falcon Heavy rocket, $255 million, and no deadline. <laughs> October sounds like a deadline to me. Well, no, that's a target date at this point. Okay, got it, right. Mm -hmm. And what's it going to do again that the web doesn't do or any of these others? It's going to, in the infrared, it's going to do this micro lensing. Okay, but now, the, you saw the picture of Jupiter taken by Webb. It's really weird. It's all a uh, picture taken by, um, yeah, Webb. Yeah, yeah. And and it's uh, the great red spot is a big white spot, and everything else is uh, variations of. Well, that's yellow. that's a little tricky. You know, brightness. You can set infrared cameras to represent hot things as light colors, or or dark things as light colors, or cold things as light colors. You can flip it any way you want. So when something's taken in a band that the human eye can't see, the colors are, um, what do they call it, arbitrary? False color, that's it. So, <laughs> Actually, oh, the Chrissy programmed the planetarium to show the James Webb images. You know, you can put them up on the, on the full dome and things. Yeah. And there's, uh, she has all five there. And I was doing all five showing people the last couple of weekends. And when you get to the last one, which is the cosmic cliffs, the Carina Nebula, you mm -hmm. zoom in on it and, and the whole screen just ends up going black because somehow it's <laughs> failing to show the last image. And so I just told people, well, we were showing you the other ones in, in false color, but this one is in, in the actual colors. It's real color, yeah. <laughs> By the way, your Shechar cat keeps popping in and out. Yeah, snacky yeah. time is approaching. Oh, okay, that's right, yeah. <laughs> but if an infrared telescope uh, sees things only in infrared, what is something, let's say, blue or green? If that it's seeing, is it just white? It, if, they, if it, it, it probably has a filter to block blue green out of it. And you just yeah, run, run. What, what, what you're seeing is basically the picture that's returned from them is a matrix of numbers. Okay. There's a value at each point. And that value represents the intensity of the, of the light at those wavelengths. And they take those numbers and they arbitrarily say the numbers between one and five are going to be blue. The numbers between five and ten are going to be green, you know. So that's what's happening. So it colorizes. It's really kind of not what we're seeing, but it is as close as we can get, I guess. Right, right. exactly. And, and when you make a presentation, you you highlight different colors to make different points in your talk. 
And so you completely arbitrarily reassign colors. There is no what it really looks like in out of visible band images. But the Juno spacecraft, which is orbiting Jupiter, those are real live pictures. That's our <laughs> color band, right? Those, those take pictures in the visible and those can be faithfully represented similar to what you would see if you were there with your eyes before you died. But often what you see is NASA releases the, the matrix of data basically and people arbitrarily colorize it to make it look fantastic. Right, yeah. Okay, and they've done that to these deep field shots from Webb? All those distant galaxies have been colorized to yeah. catch up? Yeah. Well, uh, before we go real quickly, uh, it looks like you've entered the priesthood there, uh, oh. Chuck. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there you go, okay. You want to quickly uh, tell us uh, in our final minute what's to, to look for in outreach to come in two weeks? No, in one week, a week from this Friday is our meeting, right? At night. And, and then two right, weeks. But, but on, on Friday, we're at Refugio. Saturday, we're at Carpinteria State Beach with telescopes. Okay. What night is Westmont? Third, Third Friday of every month. Yes, okay. this, uh, the 19th, Ron, of August. Okay. We're all going to be over at your house later for bread, uh, Tom. <laughs> thank you, Bruce, and thank you, Jerry, and thank you, Chuck, and we'll do it all again next week. Take care of your wives and yourselves. Keep your masks on when out in public in those incredible racing cars called Teslas. Okay. And we'll and do it again you. next week. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thank we have the Santa Barbara Astronomical Unit. Take thank care. You.